The Sustainable Energy for All Forum was held right here in Kigali, Rwanda, with the country hosting one of the biggest convocations in the world. Stakeholders from diverse backgrounds came together to find solutions, track progress and implement new strategies for achieving a just and universal access to clean, reliable and affordable energy around the world. Welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. In this episode, we focus on the recently concluded Sustainable Energy for All Forum. I'll be your host, Tessie Carvin. Almost everything we need in our daily life heavily depends on energy. Energy fuels economies and powers many of the services that you and I depend on, like hospitals, schools, hotels, transportation, among others. Now, despite its importance, almost 800 million people globally live without access to electricity, majority of them being in Africa. Happening for the very first time on African soil, the Sustainable Energy for All Forum that was held in Kigali, Rwanda, took place at an opportune time and was described as a landmark global gathering. It is indeed an honor to have the first Sustainable Energy Global Forum on the African continent. This is a landmark global gathering, and over the next few days, we will take stock of progress, showcase success, and identify solutions we can take forward to achieving Sustainable Development Goal 7, universal access to clean and affordable energy that is just and equitable clean energy transitioning. Energy is the golden thread that helps us achieve all other development goals as well as the goals outlined in the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Achieving net zero by 2050 must mean leaving no one behind. We must act on climate, but we must put people first. Our theme for this forum is driving bold action for a people-centered energy transition, which is inspired by two key messages that underpin our work at Sustainable Energy for All, and I'm sure will resonate with you here today. One, People must be at the heart of the energy transition. Our energy future must be clean, but it must also be just, inclusive, and equitable. Putting people first in the transition to clean energy was reiterated throughout the forum in keeping with the theme, driving bold action for a people-centered energy transition. I think for this continent, this is a crucial conversation because 80% of those without access, sustainable access to energy, live in Africa. Uh, so this is a bread and butter issue for the continent and having this conference here has created a platform, an opportunity to really have a deeper dive on some of the you know, um, issues that we've been looking at and co-create Africa's story as Africa prepares for COP27, which is Africa's COP, right? right? So what are the positions that Africa will table mm. and the negotiations that will have to be had? So it's been important to have conversations around just transitions, for instance, what does it mean? Mm. You know, we have a situation here where, you know, historical responsibility for climate change is not really shared. Africa's share of that is it's minute. Yeah. But the burden of climate change is shared. It's a, there's a collective burden there. Africa bears the brunt of a lot of what happens uh, on climate change, Correct. even though its contribution is. So just transitions mean a lot to Africa. In other words, Africa has to participate and contribute to a decarbonized world. Right. But to do so, and its journey towards that low carbon reality, has to be supported mm -hmm. in three or four different ways. The financing that's mm -hmm. required for that, mm -hmm. the technology and knowledge that needs to be transferred, mm -hmm. but also the capacities that need to be built. Yeah. And it has to be done in such a way that no one loses out. Yeah. 
While significant progress has been made towards attaining SDG 7, energy access varies widely across countries and the current rate of progress falls short of what will be required to achieve the goal. Rwanda's President Paul Kagame weighs in on this. Switching to renewable energy is crucial. That is why creating an enabling environment to attract investment in sustainable energy is so important. Allow me to elaborate on three ways in which this can be accomplished on our continent. First, expanding the use of off-grid technologies and standalone systems can help bring power to rural communities in Africa more quickly. Second, going forward, we need to integrate industrial policy with the sustainable energy policy. We need to, uh, to plan now to be able to power Africa's future industries sustainably but without slowing down our development. The data centers that need to be built in Africa to support the growth of information technology services are one example. Vaccine manufacturing is set to grow in Africa in the coming years. We can work to make the sector green right from the outset. Lastly, strong public energy utilities are central to access and affordability. They need to be professionally managed and financially viable. According to the International Renewable Energy Agency, of the 2.8 trillion US dollars invested in renewables globally between the year 2000 and 2020, only 2% went to Africa, despite the continent's enormous renewable energy potential and its need to bring modern energy to billions of citizens still lacking access. Financing renewables is crucial for a faster transition. The, this is the continent where you really truly do blended financing, right? This is when the philanthropic grant money counts. This is when the private sector money counts. This is when you focus on resource-based finance. This is where you try everything out and see what works. And you'd be surprised even within a country it could be different types of financing mechanisms. This is when you know you look at what are the other different risk guarantees. Who gives the risk guarantees? Does it have to come from a DFI? Can it just come from you know a development institution? What can actually happen? So what I'm hoping for this as well is we also challenge the norm because we've never been in this situation. We still haven't had a country fully transition, yeah. even with all the money in the world. You know, in those countries, we're now asking the poorest countries to do the same, exactly. right? So there needs to be like, come on guys, let's be serious about this. If you want people to invest in renewables, then the money has to be there. Yeah. Developed countries found 17 trillion at less than 1% money to fix a global crisis. It shows money, money can come if things are, are, are critical. And that's what I want to elevate from this. This is crisis, right? Yeah. People having energy is the difference between life and death for many people. Yes. And we, we shouldn't underestimate it. It's just like how not having access and clean cooking kills four million women a year. That is crisis yeah. to me. It's yeah. not an inconvenience and yeah. that is if there's a primary thing I want to get forward, it's that, mm. that this has to be taken as a crisis. It just can't be taken as a, this is something that's happening to, you know, one side of the world. 
Apart from access to funding, the transition to clean, reliable and affordable energy will take going beyond the conversations to actually taking tangible actions on ground. In Rwanda, a number of projects are underway to ensure this transition happens. This is not just another conversation for Africa. This is a life and death conversation for Africa. All right. And for us here in Rwanda, we've looked at it in terms of what can we contribute to the conversation, mm -hmm. but what, how else can we also be helped to, make, to take our responsibilities forward? Mm -hmm. So we've looked at changes that we can make in the transport sector. Mm -hmm. Rwanda has made significant investments in ensuring that a lot of the motorbikes, 35,000 motorbikes on Rwanda's roads, a significant number of those are being converted to electric as we speak. Rwanda also, a lot of its energy is coming from, uh, from, from hydro and, and other sources that are, that are greener. But we still have a challenge. A lot of people in Rwanda are still dependent on charcoal. And that is a huge challenge because it's leading to deforestation. As UNDP, through the Amayaga project, for example, we have been able to distribute 60,000 uh, cleaner cook stoves and more efficient cook stoves that can help to reduce the dependence on charcoal, amongst many other things that we're doing in this country. A couple of other challenges still need to be addressed to support Africa's quest to make the energy transition. The task is monumental. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, just to get to where we want to get it as Africa, uh, in terms of clean energy, yeah. we need to spend about $170 billion a year uh, until 2030. Um, this is money that will compete for, for other priorities. It will take away from the money that we must use for achieving other SDGs and many other things, right? And smaller economies and small countries like Rwanda cannot afford that. But Rwanda has been punching above its weight. At the moment, we are discussing possibilities of how we can access finances from global carbon markets. And those finances, if we are able to do so, they will enable the Rwandese government and the industry in Rwanda to be able to make those transformations that are needed to move us to a low, low, low carbon economy. And what we do need are international partners, international governments, looking more favorably at uh, countries like Rwanda who are trying to play their part and see if we can structure deals, not as ODA, not as overseas development assistance, mm -hmm but deals that will use the same market instruments that will move us to somewhere where Rwanda gains, Africa gains, and the rest of the world gains. So that's on the financing. On the technology, we also need help with the technology, yeah. either to start developing our own technologies here or to access technology that's already available. Yeah. As the head of the UNDP here, I've been trying to get an electric car to drive. Mm -hmm. We got hold of Mercedes-Benz, they said we're not selling to Africa. Mm -hmm. We got hold of uh, BMW, they're not selling to Africa. Even VW, which is based here, yeah. they're not selling electric vehicles to Africa. Mm -hmm. How is Africa expected to make the transition to a low carbon economy when the very same technology that can enable it is not being, is not being made available? <coughs> yeah. Those are things that we need to, to address. Yeah, it's not like Africa is not paying yeah. the cost of the electric vehicle itself. Mm -hmm. We're paying and probably paying more. Yeah. And we can develop the infrastructure to be able to support it. Right. So these are things that we need to correct in our multilateral systems. Right. One of the main objectives of the forum was to spar investment in clean energy access, efficiency and transition. New financial commitments were made, with approximately 347 million US dollars being announced by the end of the forum. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Doing Business in Rwanda. Thank you so much for watching. Share your feedback with us on Twitter. Our handle is at CNBC Africa or tag me directly at Tessie Cavan. Bye for now.